I would like to introduce our program for today. He didn't want me to say too much about him, so I will respect his request. It's difficult for me to be a minimalist, but I guess I can accommodate it. So um, it's him standing over here. Do you, do you, you want me to mention your name? You Is that, do that. Okay, you all right, that. I'll do that. And you, so you might have guessed he might be, although he won't admit to it, he might be a musician, but we're not positive. So if you will, please, a good Tuesday club, welcome to Alan Steiner. to tell you i'm really excited to be here i, I don't know if you and, and if you remember about two three years ago or early in the pandemic um actually i'm counting on this group not remembering that i was actually on zoom a couple of years ago and it's so nice i mean zoom's great and there's uh, you know i don't no, no offense to all you people joining here on zoom i'm grateful that you're here it's great to have a live audience to to talk to directly as well um so thank you we are live. Yes. Okay. So I'm here. I asked Bob not to tell you what I'm doing here. What is this? Anybody can tell me what this thing is. Okay. I, it's, I heard something interesting. I'll get to that in a second. Okay. It's a bass. Uh, a lot of names, double bass, bass. Uh, um, well, we'll talk about the names of this too. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to play a little bit. I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about my life as a professional musician. Uh, some of the people I've met, some of the things that I've done, and hopefully I want to make it as a conversation. So really all the way through the program, if any of you have any questions, please ask me. I will make up an answer. Okay. <laughs> all right. So uh, this is a base. It's a member of a family of instruments what family is it strings. it's the strings amazingly it has strings yes you're correct what are the other instruments in that family okay so from the smallest we have the violin then a little bigger is the viola cello and then the bass so if i wanted to play on the bass the sounds that the other instruments made uh, for instance, if I wanted to make a sound roughly of a violin, I'd have to reach way down here, but in the bass world, this is actually way up here. And it would sound something like this. So yeah, something like a violin. So the next largest instrument is the viola. Uh, so it's going to sound what? It's going to sound higher or lower? Thank you. Yes, lower. No, I don't look at my finger. Okay. So if you, you know, a lot of people don't know the viola because it's so it looks like a little larger violin. It's sort of tucked in the middle of the orchestra, and it's interesting with the viola players because they have a bit of a complex because they tend to play a lot of off beats. You know, um chuck, um chuck. We're the um, they're the chuck. Um chuck, um chuck, um chuck. So when they practice their scales. They don't play every note. They play every other note. And I'm going to get called on that one. OK, so if I want to make a sound something like a viola, it's going to be like this. So that's something like the sound of viola. Next largest instrument is the cello. And you sit, you sit to play the cello, and it's a little bigger, and it's going to sound something like this. So that's something like the sound of a cello. 
Now, the next biggest instrument, well, the biggest instrument and the lowest and the best is, of course, the bass, okay? And the bass is going to sound something like this. Actually, it'll sound a lot like this, okay? <laughs> And can you, I, I've got a question, can, especially those here, can you feel the bass? Uh, now, with all the carpeting, you don't get quite the same resonance, but it's, that's part of the fun of playing. We, we feel what we're playing. Eh, the violin, they don't feel anything. We, 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 we feel this. Now, um, the place of the bass in the orchestra is the foundation. We are literally the bottom. We hold the orchestra up. Uh, and... You know, it, it, it's funny, I'm going to be talking, it's funny, I, I always harken back to some of my uh, youth orchestra and days at school, because there were some fun things that happened, but I was playing, oh, I, I, you know, I didn't tell you about myself. I'm a native of uh, Toronto, Canada. Uh, uh, I've been, now I've been here since 1986. Uh, I am legal, uh, <laughs> and uh, I am, I am a dual citizen, uh, and um I uh, went. I went to school in Philadelphia to the Curtis Institute of Music. Uh, now, now, okay. I'm glad somebody knows. Okay, uh, it's it's a small conservatory. A lot of people, unless you're sort of in the music, know you you may not know the school. So, let me ask you this: How many of you have ever heard of Juilliard? Everybody knows Juilliard. Okay, so I like to compare Curtis to Juilliard. It's a good school, Juilliard. Curtis, thank you very much. Curtis Institute of Music, remember that. If you look across the orchestra downtown, you'll see half of their principal players went to Curtis. Okay, so uh, a very fine school indeed, um, despite the fact that I graduated there. Okay, so Curtis Institute in Philadelphia. So, but when I was, uh, so I was playing in the Canadian National Youth Orchestra, big orchestra, really good orchestra, and we were doing a Mahler symphony and because of the because of the size of the stage, um, they had to do an odd configuration of the orchestra. And so what they had is the basses. And there were like nine of us strung across the back of the back of the or instead of it to the side, we were across the back in a line. And uh, then we had the the brass here, the winds in front of us. And so we were kind of separated from the strings, which is not what we're normally doing. And we're playing this one movement of the smaller symphony, and it's a sustained long note. Just, I don't know, it was like a low F or something, I don't remember. That's all it is. For like bar after bar after bar, really soft. Couldn't play it in tune. Our coach was beside himself. He, he was so upset at us, we could not play it in tune. Finally, he decided he'll come up, he'll sit on the stage with one. So he sat next to me, uh, it's sort of in the middle. And we played, we played this piece again. When we got to this spot, same thing, it was out of tune. So he figured out what had happened. What he said is that because we were sitting behind the brass and sitting behind the winds, we, they had tuned just a little bit different. And so the guys on that side were tuning to these guys, the guys on this side were tuning to these guys, just an imper imperceptible amount, but it makes a difference. And so he said, okay, let's decide who we're going to tune to. So we decide, okay, okay, we'll tune to the brass. So we tuned to the brass. We got the next rehearsal. We got to that spot. And, I, you know, I, it's silly. I still get chills. It's the single most exciting moment I have ever had playing my instrument. We got to that spot, played that same note that we've been playing all week, no louder, but the sound just went whoosh over the orchestra. Everybody stopped. The orchestra stopped. Where have you guys been all week? Uh, it, was, it was incredible because when it's in tune, there's just that, that's what makes a great orchestra. You know, there's good orchestras and there's great orchestras. And you just have that fine tuneness. And it, 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 so the sound, you know, I guess I've never done this, but here, um, if I'm going to play, okay. So I'm playing it. How many of you played an instrument, by the way, of any kind? Okay, so some of you have played string instruments. Okay, so if I'm playing this note, 
I can play the same note here. We call it closing. Okay, so it's the same note because when I play it, when I play, I can play it here. When I play here, I can vibrate that I can't do on the open string. Okay, a little, little thing. But just but so if you listen to this, now I'm going to move my finger just a little bit. Oh, I'm going to play them together. So it sounds like basically one, one, one note. If I move just a little bit, you hear that round, 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 that sound uh, that you hear on a piano when it's out of tune because the unisons are a little out of tune. Um, but that's what you get. So it's as you get closer, and this is something I have to teach my students is to listen. You think you're close. Now just give it a little nudge to get a little bit closer. So when we're all playing the same note together, that sound just gets bigger without having to make to make the sound. Um, I'll, I'll get on with some more stuff. I should play a little something. So I'm going to play a little piece here. This is a piece of, of Baroque music. Uh, this is in the time of Bach, you know, by 1600s, 1700s. Uh, it's called a hornpipe, and uh, you 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 probably have all heard a horn pipe. By the way, if, if you're ever in doubt, you get these names. Now this happens to be English, but very often you get these Italian names, things of, 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 especially in Baroque music. If when in doubt, if you're not sure what it means, it's probably a dance. So just, oh yeah, that's a dance, you know? So this is a horn pipe, a horn pipe that you have probably heard if you've ever been to a wedding um, from the water music, to handle water music. Da, 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 that's a, it's a popular recessional. Well, this is, this is the same kind of rhythm. Mm -hmm. The Hornpipe by Galliard. Thanks. Okay. So we talked about, uh, I talked about the different uh, the instruments in the string section. Uh, I should tell you a story because this is coming back to the name of this, of this instrument. Uh, traveling's, uh, I've got a couple of traveling stories. Traveling's always been an adventure with, uh, with the bass. Um, especially now, I haven't had to go anywhere with it other than the car since 9-11, fortunately. And I get the stories are, it's a nightmare trying to travel with these things. But back in the day, um, when I was, uh, the first time I flew with the bass, I had a bass that was a tiny bit smaller than this, but it was still a big bass. Um, I was going to audition, in, I was going from Toronto to Philadelphia to audition for school. Uh, and um, I, I was able to buy uh, an economy seat at half price on most of the airlines, you know, so it would take about a seat and a half. So I kind of squish it, you get it. And so I had my boarding pass and I get to the airport and I'd, I was flying on Allegheny Airlines. I don't know if you ever, any of you ever remember Allegheny, we used to call it Agony Airlines, you know, and uh, we had a little hot, short hop in, uh, you know, we had to go from Toronto to Erie, and Erie to Philadelphia. I've only been sick twice on the plane and both times was coming into Erie, Pennsylvania. And, um, so I, I get there and, you know, it was a turboprop. So you didn't have the gangplank. You didn't have the, the, the walkway to the thing. You had to go down to the, to the tarp, go to the, the stairs, and then you, you went back up, uh, you know, onto the plane. So, uh, so I'm down. I'm starting to walk across the tarmac. The grounds guys are going, you can't take that on the plane. I have a boarding pass going on. And I just kept walking. I get to the stairs. I look up. And at the top of the stairs... I see the, in those days, there were stewardesses. There was a stewardess at the top of the stairs. And she's like, white as a sheet, like, oh, you, 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 you can't bring that up here. I said, I got a boarding pass. I'm coming up. And I start walking up the stairs with the base. 
So I have to look over my left shoulder and I look up and leaning out of the open window of the cockpit's the captain. And he's got this smirk on his face. And you know, you know, when you fly, the captain has the last word. If he says you don't get on, you don't get on. But I'm walking up the stairs. By the time I get to the top of the stairs, captain's out by the door leaning there. He's got this great big smile on his face. You know, the poor stewardess doesn't, doesn't know what to do. And the captain looks at me and says, don't worry, I got this. I had to schlep one of these things around Europe with a friend of mine when we were kids. This is what you got to do. And he told me about extension, seat belt extensions and put it in the bulk. And, and he gave me all the to do's for this so that subsequently when I flew, I always knew how to throw around the orders. But it was good. And people were very, very nice. And on the small planes, believe it or not, it was easier than on the big planes. Because on the small planes, if you remember, those armrests come up and down. The big planes have these big clunky consoles. You can't move. So, so uh, I was able, I was able to fly. It was great. Um, another time when I had to fly, I had to fly a 747 across Canada and I got on the plane and, you know, I usually had to pre-board. So when I got on, there was nobody, nobody there. So I go way to the back of the plane and I try and get my, my base onto the seat. The, uh, the flight attendant comes over and he says, this is silly. I got a better idea. He says, come on. And he says, he grabs this end. I grab that end. We lift it up. By this time, the plane's full. We schlep this thing across the entire length of the 747 up to the front. We get to the front to the spiral staircase. He says, okay, we're going up. And we take the base and we wind the base up the spiral staircase to the first class lounge. And we get up there and it's all, um, uh, you know, white shag rug or whatever and uh, wall to wall carpeting and, 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 uh, you know, these great big seats, a few empty seats big enough to accommodate this and a bunch of drunken businessmen. And they thought it was a hoot, you know. So we go and we put this in the seat. And then uh, I, I asked the attendant, well, can I sit here with it? No. And then there's this really nice cart filled with these beautiful pastries. Can I have a pastry? No. So I went back to steerage and my base went first class. And a, a couple of times we, we did that where, where, where it went first class. Um, Okay, so that's, you know, the adventures of traveling with the bass. Nice thing is when you play, when you play in an orchestra, then it's a breeze because uh, the basses have, we have these things they call, they look and they, and for all intents and purposes, they are coffins. We call them coffins. They're big hard cases. And, you know, and at the end of the concert, put the bass in the case, close the case, lock it. Say goodbye. It's the stage guys get it on the plane, get it to wherever you're going, and you'll and it's there for you when you get there. So in that score, it's a breeze. But when you got to travel by yourself, it's it's a bummer. Um, I've been using this thing. Got an idea what this is? It's a bow. So you know. Um, oh, another story. Uh, <laughs> I was I was traveling once and I and the base was shipped, but I uh, I had my uh, bows uh, with me in uh, in a in a case, so I took them on on the plane with me. So I, I get to security, and I'm walking it through security. What's that? Oh, it's a bow. Can't take it on. What do you mean you can't take it on? We're not allowed to take weapons on. No, you know, it was in like a, it was a little case. I opened up, it's like a violin bow. Now you can't take it on. And I was trying to convince this woman that no, this was like a violin bow. It almost became a weapon. I finally was a, um, a, a, a I was finally able to uh, convince her that, yeah, I can get on. So, so I did. Um, but uh, so that's a bow. But then sometimes, sometimes I take the bow and, and I put it down. Now I'm going to test your musical knowledge here. Sometimes I use these guys, and what are they? You guys, you guys really do have a pretty good musical knowledge, and especially you don't all play. Yes, they're fingers, all right? And we pluck the string. In fact, you see the jazz guy, you know, doing that kind of stuff, all right? And, uh, but you gotta remember, I am a highly skilled, highly trained professional musician. And as such, we don't do anything in English. We have all these fancy words, more, more usually in Italian. It sounds very impressive, okay? So like doctors learning Latin. I don't, do doctors learn Latin anymore? I don't even know. Um, the word, well, do you know what the word is for plucking? 
Pizzicato. Okay, a man of knowledge over there. Good. Yes, it's Pizzicato. So, so if I wanted to play something, Pizzicato. That's pizzicato. Thank you. So remember, next time you're at a concert, you see somebody doing this. Guys doing pizzicato. So remember that you can impress you can you can impress your significant other. Um, how many of you remember Nat King Cole? No, yeah, oh, everybody sure. Uh, that's that's why I love these audiences. When I talk to the kids, they don't even know who Bullwinkle is. It drives it <laughs> it drives me nuts. I, I I love talking my contemporaries here. Um, Nat King Cole, I, I want to play just a, a little piece that uh, he made famous. Did you know that Nat King Cole was primarily, or for, uh, Bob would know this. Uh, uh, he was a pianist. That was his instrument. He came to the singing stuff later. Hard to imagine, but uh, he was he was first and primarily a, 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 a jazz pianist. So this is um, Nature Boy. <laughs> Nature Boy. Um, how many of you have gone and seen an orchestra? Gone, gone to an orchestra? Well, mostly you've just seen it. Somewhere in some way or another, you've seen an orchestra. You ever wondered, when you look at the orchestra, are any of those guys actually looking at the conductor? Have you ever thought about that? Have, have, are any of the guys in the orchestra looking at the conductor? All right. And uh, well, the fact is, we're always looking this now I tell you, I've played with conductors where we try not to look at them because they're getting in the way. But really, we are always looking at the conductor. And uh, uh, we'll try something. What I want you to do is I'll take, take one of your hand, take your arm, extend it out in front of you down below your, your eye level. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to look at your hand, look down at your hand and look at your hand. Okay. Can you see me doing this while you're looking at your hand? Peripheral vision. Okay. We tell the kids it's the third eye. You are always, 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 always cognizant of what the conductor is doing. Now, there are times where we will look up. We know there's a certain, there's a major change in speed and tempo. So we're going to look up to see what he's going to do. Plus, some conductors, they just want to see your eyes. You know, they just want to see you looking at them. 
you know. Uh, so, you know, well, I know at a certain spot, conductor is going to turn around. He's going to stare at the bases. Well, I, I, I'm going to be looking. In fact, my very first, at Curtis, my very, very first rehearsal, we did, we used to get, I don't know if you would remember the name, uh, Eugene Ormandy was the longtime conductor of the Philadelphia Orchestra. So he would come and he would conduct us at school. And uh, we were told when we were practically, we were doing Symphony Fantastique by uh, uh, Berlioz. And my, our teacher told us at our section, he says, at this particular spot, Ormandy will if the, if the guy was a mensch, he wouldn't look. When it gets really, when there's a difficult spot, you, you don't look at the whoever's playing. Let them play. Don't make them extra nervous. Well, he said, Armandy will turn around and he will stare at you at this spot. And if you aren't together with everybody else, he will get upset. And 15 years from now, when you audition for the Philadelphia Orchestra, he will remember that that kid did not look at me at his first rehearsal at Curtis. So, and it happens to be one of these things where it's up, da 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 in the first movement. And we're playing these really difficult offbeats. Well, when we got to that spot, and there were only four of us, there was nowhere to hide. Sure enough, get to that spot, he turns around, he's staring at us. So, well, I'm, I, I'm looking. So I put my hand here. I didn't move. I, I played the same two notes the whole time. I said, and I kept peripherally. I looked at the first player who was our senior and I made sure I stayed with him. And I, and I played and I stared at, so of course, Ormandy stops the orchestra, yells at the guy here, yells at the guy here for, for not watching him. I didn't play any of the notes, but I, but I, but I was watching them, you know, and it was great. So, uh, by the way, it did not help me when I auditioned uh, for the Philadelphia Orchestra, but that's okay. Um, so I would like a little, I want to do a little experiment. Okay. And so I am going to need some help. Can I ask you to give me a hand? Okay. I, can you, are you, do you mind walking or do I take in the, 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 the walk of shame around the back here? And um, would you like to help? Since you, yeah, come on up. Have you ever played an instrument? No. Oh, great. Come up. Okay. That's, that's, that's absolutely perfect then. So here's what we're going to do. Because I want, I, the, the, you'll see what the purpose is of this momentarily. So you wait for one second. What I want you to do is I'm going to count one, two, three, four. You clap in time. Okay. So one two, three, four. It's pretty good. Pretty accurate. Yeah. Okay. Now uh, with, with conviction. Okay. So now I'm going to count one, two, three, four, silent, two, three, four, clap. So in other words, I'm going to count four. You're going to count four in your head. You're going to clap. One, two, three, four, four. Well, what do you think guys? Uh, yeah. Okay. So now when you get there, really, like you really mean it, even if it's totally wrong. Okay. Well, no, you know what? This is what we say. This is what we tell the kids. Look, if you're going to make a mistake, make a real mistake. Don't, don't, don't wimp out, you know, then you'll fix it next time. Okay. So one, two, three, four. You know, he was moving so well. And then you jump the gun, but it was very close. It was good. So now we're going to complicate the issue because we're going to have two people do the same thing. So now you get to come on up here. Okay. So uh, let's, uh, yeah, I guess you can just stand next to each other. And I'm, we're going to do the same thing. First, it's going to be one, two, three, four, clap. Okay. So one, two, three, four. That was really pretty good. All right. So now one, two, three, four, silent clap. Okay, but I'm going to ask you not to do this. I want it all in here. Okay, one, two, three, four. You in the back, why didn't you play? You said silent. It's a silent. Uh, uh, okay, fair enough. Fair enough. We're, we're going to go one, two, three, four, silent, two, three, four, clap. So the second measure, the second four are silent. Okay, so you, in other words, you have to, we wanna see if you can count them in your head. 
Okay, so here you go. One, two, three, four. Well, I'll tell you what, they were wrong exactly together. So there's something to be said for that. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. That's, that's great. Okay, you can leave, yes. <laughs> So th the point is now, uh, sometimes what I'll do is I'll add a, a third and a fourth. And then what do we have? We have a, a quartet. And uh, it's, it's so important for a musician to be able to count here. I love going to, I don't know, you, you guys have grandchildren. You ever go to co their concerts at school? <laughs> Next time you go, if you go see the band or the orchestra, watch their feet. I love it. Watch, watch the kids. They're all... But they're all at different times, so they're all be they're all beating, but they're all beating at different times, and and uh, you know, but so you learn, you 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 can't be doing this as a professional musician, and you can't be doing this. You have to learn. Um, hello, is that me? Uh, my heart. Um, one thing um, I, I I like to do, and I tell my students to do this too. When you get down to 10 seconds on the microwave, turn around and count down the last 10 seconds. See if you can get to the, the, uh, the buzzer or the, uh, the beep at the same time, because it's seconds. So it, it's, it's, it's a good way of practicing to see how close you get. But it, it's, it's so important. So if you watch, uh, you watch a string quartet, especially, there's where you really notice it. You can see a good string quartet there. They're, 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 they're not just looking at the music, they're locked into each other. They're playing. So uh, there's a leader, usually they'll say the first violin or whoever happens to be playing the solo part at that, po at that point. They are just locked in and watching each other all the time. And so they have that internal clock going. And it's, it's so, so important to have that. So you can't just rely on the conductor and the orchestra doing this. You, ha you, have, to, you, have, to, you have to be listening. You have to be able to, to feel what's, what's happening. You know, it's, it's, um, I can say the orchestra is the ultimate team. Uh, we, we, they, we have to work together. Um, I've done, I had to do, uh, I had to, I, I've done a couple of uh, rotor, uh, rotary club uh, uh, things. And I, the first time I was asked to do that, I think, well, what do I have to offer a bunch of businessmen? But then I realized, you know what? It's the team aspect of the music that is what's so valuable and how you as, a, as an orchestra have to work together. Everybody has to be on the same page. And we're also, apart from maybe a surgeon, I don't know of any professions where, you know, you can, you, you can make a million dollars in bat, you know, bat 250, uh, you gotta be on all the time. And uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot of, and that's the hardest part of playing an instrument. It's not this stuff. It's, it's the mental aspect of playing an instrument and the focus and the concentration. Uh, and that's what always impresses me with the guys, especially the guys in the big orchestras. Uh, the focus that they have to be on all the time. And it, it's hard and you have to do it. You know, you, you can't just work, you can't play on automatic. You've got, you really have to be thinking about what you're doing. So that's, uh, anyway, it's just give you an idea a little bit of what it's like how you have to work together. You know, it's one thing to do this and it's another thing to do that at the same time with, with somebody else. Um, so I'm gonna play now a uh, couple of little Yiddish pieces. Uh, uh, my, my Yiddish isn't any good, so I'm, I won't even try and pronounce this one. Uh, well, maybe I will. Maybe someone can help me here. It's uh, Yisrael Voreta. Uh, I don't know if I pronounce it right. It's Israel in the Torah. It's a liturgical piece. Uh, and then uh, followed by um, Oifin Pripichik. Uh, and I have a little story about the Oifin that I'll tell after. So we'll do the uh, Yisrael Voreta first.
little pieces of it. So I, I was doing this program at a uh, nursing home retirement set of rehab thing in Evanston uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, so I'm playing through the thing and I was playing for the memory care unit. It's always a challenge. Uh, it's very rewarding, but it's really a challenge to play for these guys. And um, well, partway through the, through the program, I'm looking around and I recognize there's probably a few Jewish people in the group. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to play these pieces. And I played the Oifen Pripyat Chicken. When I was done, I happened to look over to my right and sitting in the wheelchair in the corner was this gentleman who had basically shown no interest or awareness the whole program. But I'm looking over and he's got tears running down his eyes. My dad used to sing that to me. My dad used to sing that to me. Uh, it, it made my day. It basically made my career. I said, this is why I play. This is why we play. This is the power that music has. And you see it with these people, how it jogs mem memories. And I've gotten that a lot whenever I've played this now. And, and to people where there is not, you know, a Jewish face for, for miles around, but they seem to recognize this piece, this piece or just the emotion of the piece. And it's absolutely fascinating to see. And, and it really, it validates, it validates what, what we do as musicians is when we get a chance to, to do something like that. Now, uh, I guess I should make sort of an equal, equal, equal time. Uh, so, um, and given the season, I'll do, uh, I'll do this little piece, I think you know. Okay. <laughs> by a Jewish guy, <laughs> Mel Torme. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, you know, I'm thinking back with uh, this. This is a, a, a story that I, I always like to tell. It's, again, back to my days at, at Curtis. In my first year at school, um, one, one of my, uh, my buddies, in the first, he was only there for one term. He was a clarinet player. He was one of the very few at that time African American faces at school. Uh, and generally in classical music, you just did not see African Americans. And uh, he was a real fine, as it was everybody at school, he was a real fine clarinetist. But his calling was alto sax jazz. Uh, the name is uh, Al, uh, uh, Bob. Alex Foster, I don't know. He apparently he played. Oh, he played in some of the uh, one of the uh, 
a, a couple of big bands and uh and i think he was also a regular in one of the big uh one of the nighttime tv shows for a long time you know great great stuff but at that time you know he was there studying clarinet you know then he figured out that no that's not what he wants to be doing but um he had heard that there was going to be a jazz concert in town in philly uh, a bunch of us should go so a group of us got together we went and he brought along his horn because you know it, it's some of the cl little clubs you know it's it's kind of a, almost a tradition that at the end of the last set in the evening if you brought your instrument sometimes you can just get up there and and you can jam with it with the greats and so alex brought his horn along uh, figure maybe he can jam at the end of this thing. Well, we get down to the venue. It's the Spectrum in, in Philadelphia. There's 15,000 people. Probably not going to be jamming at the end of this concert. But this is some of the lineup for this concert that night. Miles Davis, Thelonious Monk, um, Weather Report, um, Dizzy Gillespie, uh, Maynard Ferguson, one band after the other is like a hall of fame thing i looked it up once i don't know if it's ever happened uh, outside of one of the big festivals but it was just so cool so he had all these great bands playing so danny was told if you ever had a chance to meet desi gillespie this is what you had to do you had to go up to him and you had to say knock knock who's there 2 30. oh better see a dentist terrible joke 2.30, better see a dentist. All right. So go ahead. I don't know. It's three, four years later. I'm playing in the Jerusalem Symphony. No, it wasn't. I'm saying I'm going to have I'm playing in the Quebec Symphony. I've just been everywhere. I'm, I, I, I'm playing in the Quebec Symphony. And we're doing Jazz Meets Symphony concert. Guess who's the, uh, the artist? It's Dizzy Gillespie. So I have to do this. So before the concert, I go and knock on his door. Door opens. Yep, there's Dizzy Gillespie. Knock, knock. Who's there? 2.30. Better see a dentist. Who told you that? And he just starts to laugh. It was hysterical, but it was exactly what was supposed to happen. And he was so nice. And, and uh, you know, he, you know he, he did me a favor. He went, blew up his face for me. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, but this is one of the fun things about doing what we do. Now, if I had any of my, my colleagues here, they would just roll their eyes because they've all been through this stuff. They've all met these people. But that's one of the joys of doing what we do. We get to play with some of the greatest artists in the world. You know, I played a con in Jerusalem. I played a concert with Danny Kay. Uh, that, that was a gem. You know, um, and you can actually see not that program, but if you go and you look Danny Kay, New York Philharmonic, you can see the program he used to always do. Uh, it was just hysterical. Danny Kay, I play with Yo-Yo Ma, you know, Chick Corea. So, it, you know, it, there's a whole, the gamut and, you know, usually backing up. In fact, they used to play a lot when we used to play, they had uh, the festival orchestra at, at Ravinia. Uh, uh, we, we used to be up there on the stage there. Uh, I love those jobs because they got great parking. But, uh, but we'd be on the stage uh, and my favorite was the, was the uh, swing concert. And so all we do is we just drone. We're just a backup orchestra. But I was always amazed at my colleagues in the in the band. These guys would nail these incredibly complex and difficult uh, rhythms. And it was basically rehearsal concert. And I used to go and say, how do you guys do that? Because we, we, we do it all the time. You know, but it's absolutely uh, it's absolutely amazing. And, uh, uh, you know, and the, the people we meet, I did. I, I played out in El Elton's. If you ever get a chance to go out there, Elton's got a really good orchestra. And um, I, I, I played a concert with them one time with uh, Debbie Reynolds. And uh, what what they normally do is we play one read through with the with their with her conductor and her little combo that comes with just to read through the charts. And then maybe, maybe, maybe she'll come in for the sound, just for a sound check at the end. She might sing a tune or two, you know, because, I mean, she's done this program a million times. Well, all I could think is Debbie Reynolds. I thought she was dead, <laughs> you know, and and because uh, I hadn't heard from her in ever, forever, and I didn't, I don't know, you know. So she comes in late in the uh, in the rehearsal. A little lady with the, with the purple uh, 
bouffant, whatever you called it, hair, you know, beehive, you know, she, you know, she was tiny and she comes up with the Coke bottle glasses and she looked like everybody's grandmother. And, you know, she, she, she comes in, she, 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 she looks at the first cellist. You know who I am? I'm Princess Leia's mother. <laughs> and we're going, oh my God, this is going to be the greatest embarrassment of all time. And she sang, all right, you know, she sang a little bit. When that was that, we played that night. It was the best concert I ever played. She came in, she had completely transformed. You know, she put on her costume. She got, she lost the glasses. Uh, and uh, she was hysterical. And she comes on the stage, she walks out there. Um, apparently, originally, she was, a she was a replacement for Doc Severinsen. So she walks out on the stage. She goes, so how many of you thought you were coming to see Doc Severinsen? So a few people put their hands up. Okay. Then she says, how many of you thought I was dead? <laughs> we are uh, the whole orchestra. We just all fell off our chairs. But we all thought, to, thought the same thing. And she was so self-deprecating and fun. And she talked about all her life, which was a difficult one. And, you know, all her, her, her marriages and stuff like that. But it was so much fun. But the nice thing is that she appreciated the orchestra. And we, we weren't just they're backing her up. We, we were an integral part of her performance. And she also knew that we were all dying to get pictures. So she volunteered. She said, look, I'll come downstairs to the orchestra room at the break. You guys can all have pictures. And we all got pictures with her. And so it was really nice. And we've gotten that a lot where, you know, we have people, they, they, most of these guys, uh, they, they appreciate what you're doing. Uh, Yo-Yo Ma, he is the real deal. Uh, he, this guy is what you see is what you get. Um, and he just, he, he makes you feel like you are the greatest orchestra ever to play this particular piece. And he's played with everybody and he's just a gem. And, and most, most with very few exceptions. Most of these guys are really, really nice. They're nice to the musicians and, the, and they, uh, and, and they appreciate what we're doing. And that, 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 that says something. Um, Okie doke. So let's, well, I guess I should, you know, I'm playing some music. I'm a classical musician. So I am going to play a little bit of Bach. All right. Uh, this is actually written for uh, unaccompanied cellos from one of the Bach suites. It's a jig. Remember when you don't know what the, it means, what is it? Probably it's a dance. Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of dance. It's a dance. All right. So this is a jig. Jumping around here, I want to play. This is a piece I just started fooling around with, and it'll be sort of my version of this. Um, I suddenly got this great love for Ennio Morricone. Is that a name that any of you recognize? Have you ever seen any of the spaghetti westerns with uh, Clint Eastwood? You know, he he wrote all the um, the uh, the sound the soundtracks, and he's just written all kinds of. Um, absolutely fabulous music for, for, for movies. And I, it's just, his, his music is incredible. And I, I didn't, I wasn't aware of it. There, there's another piece that I play, but I just started fooling around with this one. Uh, and so I'm going to play it a little arrangement. It's called uh, Gabriel's Oboe. Um, 
I should know the movie it's from, but I'm not even sure. It's Gabriel's Oboe, or in this case, Gabriel's Bass by Ennio Morricone. I'm, I'm going to tell you a story now. Now, uh, I'm sorry, but it's very sad. It's very tragic. So you might you might want to take out your your hankies. Yeah, and um, it's it's about a young maiden and a monster, and it's called the maiden and the monster. Once upon a time, a long time ago, there was a young maiden who lived in a small little cottage. Next to the small little cottage was a little garden with lots of pretty flowers. Now, down the road from the little cottage was a little town with lots of happy people. Down the road from the little town was a dark, mysterious cave. In that dark, mysterious cave was a dark, mysterious monster. One day, while a young maiden was out picking flowers in her garden, the monster came out of his cave. He went past the little town and came up to the little cottage. And he opened the little gate and went into the little garden where he saw the young maiden bending over, picking up flowers. Well, a monster crept up behind the young maiden and lightly tapped her on the shoulder. Well, the maiden turned around with a start. And when she saw the monster, she screamed. Well, nearby in the town, they heard her scream. And they came running to the rescue. But when they got to the little cottage, and opened the little gate 
and went into the little garden. It was too late for the poor young maiden. Had eaten the monster. <laughs> Maiden of the Monster. Yes, now you may wipe your, your, wipe your tears. Um, I guess we only have a minute or two, a, a minute or two left, correct? So um, let me ask you this do you have any questions for me? And I will gladly make up an answer. <laughs> Just a question on the, the price of an orchestra worthy bass like you have. What would it be? Uh, in dollars today well it's interesting with that and this is with string players especially it's sort of a catch-22 you need a fine instrument to compete but you need that job in order to pay for those instruments um i this let, let me put it to you this one is underinsured um i've been told that i've got to get a check this is this particular instrument's probably um in the six figures anyway um uh, uh but you know some of the and there and it's not nearly as expensive the bases do not compare to the price of violins uh the violence it's insane uh they literally they can be in the millions so that's if you are insistent on getting like this a fine old italian instrument but there are great modern instruments made and it is incorrect to say they don't make them like they used they they absolutely do there are great makers of all this of all the instruments uh and that's in the band too there are great makers out there now and sometimes you know it takes it's a little time and you know to work the instrument in the the the, the wood learns but um it it, it is very expensive it's it's an investment but uh, if you get a good instrument uh it can be for a lifetime the surprise for a lot of people is the cost of these guys you know, I mean, this one is a good instrument. I don't even know. It's a Canadian-made instrument, uh, a bow. I actually had two of his bows stolen. Uh, but there, I think his his bows now are something like three or four thousand dollars. I had I had um, uh, a bow that I got years ago. Uh, it was a little light, a light little skinny little bow. But I needed the second bow. But a really fine Italian maker. Uh, but someone had sat on it and broke it so it was it had been repaired but on a diagonal so it could be repaired and i used it i i played downtown i played the uh i played the the ring the entire ring using that bow uh but when i went to sell it you know i paid about 800 dollars for it uh so i i didn't know what to ask for especially because it had been broken so i had one of my colleagues who was interested in it, and i said well you go find out how much it's worth and you pay so he was told it would be like two thousand dollars so fine uh, he had, uh, but he was told had it been in mint condition, it would have been a twelve thousand dollar bow. So you know, it, yeah. Question. Yeah, we have more. We have a, a couple on Zoom. We've had oh, forty please. people on Zoom, but we have one from the audience here first. I used to keep company with a. I used to keep company with a violist, and uh, she said that the best instruments in the world nowadays don't come from Eastern Europe or Western Europe, but from China. Would you agree with that? I couldn't, I, that I could not tell you, but um, I have my doubts. <laughs> uh, and they're certainly making a tons and tons of instruments are coming there and some really good, but some like everything else, there's some good stuff and there's some trash. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I had a, a you know, a, um, a friend of mine who we went to school together we played in quebec together and actually for just retired a few years ago after 30 years as concert master in boston uh malcolm lowe uh he was looking at an instrument um he was trying out we we all sat down and listened to it. he was trying out a whole bunch of really fine you know six figure and this is you know 30 40 years ago six figure violins to see he wanted to change violins uh after trying out all those instruments he decided he preferred his Regina Saskatchewan violin over those. And so he kept that at least for a while, you know, so it's a matter. I think it's also sometimes taste and don't assume that because something is a Stradivarius, it's a great fiddle. It was made by great makers, 
but you know they like everybody else some, some are better than others you know but you know if you but if you really do have that you know all these little two dollar 250 dollar instrument school instruments all have stradivarius inside yeah. but if you have a real stradivarius uh you can read you you can retire even better than what you're doing now. Okay, yes. More, more from uh, from the uh, Zoom group. Um, more about the bow. Uh, there's just a comment. There's from um, Monica. There's an excellent documentary called "The Bow Makers," made in 2019 about master bow makers. Fascinating film. Uh, a quick one from uh, Linda, who's asking, "What wood is used to fashion a base?" I, I'm terrible at this because there's I, and I, I meant to look it up. I, I, I'm awful with that. Okay, let me let me give you something that you might know more than on this. Uh, have you ever broken a string in concert? A string, no. But my first profession, my first professional job, first time, I walk in, I'm playing in the middle. Of, I we were rehearsing, I think, for an opera or something like that. I hear pow, rattle, 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 rattle. So I'm looking around. And I say, everybody's looking at me. So what are you looking at me for? And they all look and they're pointing. The tail piece that here, the wire at the bottom snapped. And of course, when that happens, the strings just hang, everything falls to the floor. And, and it was so embarrassing, but you know, what are you gonna do? Bass strings rarely break. Okay. Um, you may have noticed if you see in the symphony, some of these guys have this little piece this extension on their base if you look at it it's what it is it's an extended c string instead of e a d g uh, e a d g it's a c string so it goes down a little lower uh, i for various reasons i wasn't able to put one on this base um and those have a tendency because they're long and they have a much wider vi uh, vibrate uh, vibration uh they they can break once in a while but uh you know i saw i saw a concert uh i've seen a couple of times but i saw one where uh I think it was Pinka Zuckerman was playing some solos and he, and he broke a string. Okay. So he just said, excuse me, he ran back, had the strings in the back, put them on, and that was it. Okay, a couple more. Um, are there any solo jazz musicians that play bass? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh many, 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 many. Who might you think was one of the outstanding? Uh, well, I mean, you know, Rufus Reed is one that uh, one that I just happen to know. Uh, you know, I tell you what, you want to hear. Um, here's here's a great one to look up. Esperanza Spalding. I've got a couple of her songs. And you know, this woman, young uh, woman, is a wonderful, wonderful singer and a great bass player. And I mean, to me, it's hard enough to sing, it's hard enough to play, but to do them both and do them both really, really well. And she uh, uh, she's one absolutely worth uh, looking up. And yes, Wait, let me give you one more, and then I'm going to turn it over. Yes, just want to finish the Zoom question. There was one last Zoom okay. question. Have you heard the expression that the um, loudest sound of the bass is its absence? That so, you, you cannot. Right. Somebody asked that last time. Yes. And that kind that kind of comes back to remember that story I told you about playing in the youth orchestra when we played that low note, and then when we got it in tune, suddenly everybody heard us because we weren't there because we weren't clear enough. Uh, the bass is the foundation. Um, the house isn't going to stand up for long without without a good foundation. So you have, and this is what makes the Chicago Symphony. The Chicago Symphony has a fabulous bass section, and you know it's a fabulous orchestra, but if you have it's what you need so you need that foundation so it is true you've got to have that so and if it's not there there's just something missing yes are you affected very much by humidity heat and everything as you move from place to place with this and me or the base yes yes <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh yes yeah and um uh you know that's why you're we're constantly tuning you know, and it literally, and, and it's even more so with something like the violin, uh, literally, you know, going from room A to room B, you, you, you it, it can change the, because uh, it's, it's wood, it's, it's alive, it's, it's expanding and it's contracting. And, uh, no, nah, not so that's, that's, that's not advantage of having steel strings in the it, many years ago, it was, it was got strings. 
and there they would dry. You had to put mutton on or something. You had to keep them moist, and those would break. Uh, you don't get that with so, as much with the strings, but with the instrument, it's the expansion and contraction. Um, I'm a piano tuner, and I deal with pianos all the time. And uh, it's it's the people don't realize it's not this that puts them out of tune. It's the exp it's the change in in humidity, expansion and contraction of the instrument that, that affects things. Thank you. When you were talking about the absence of the bass, uh, there's a big band that I've been listening to up in this area for about 12 years now. And the bass player is habitually late. <laughs> <laughs> and you you hear it instantly. Oh, you're saying late, not as an absent, but late. No, 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 not late. No, not late in coming in. I mean, late in showing up. Oh, okay. And the poor keyboard player tries to fill in the bass, and it's hollow. It's very, very hollow by, because you need the bass. Yeah. Yeah. It's just well, a real you know, thing. I was, I was, I was playing when I was a kid and I, a teenager. And I'm playing in this band, and we're and and there's a trio bass. You know, we I put the dark glasses on and go like that. You know, but I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, but the the drummer is yelling at me, push it, push it, drive, drive. I say, what do you mean drive? I'm listening to you. He says, no, I'm listening to you. I had no idea. I figured, well, he's the loudest. Everybody listens to the drum. Mm -mm. They're li they're all listening to the bass. So it was it was an education for me. Yeah. When you were telling your Dizzy Gillespie story, uh, I have one of my own. I was at a New Year's Day party with him yeah. years ago. Yeah. And here I am, like, you know, I'm a big jazz fan and I do a jazz radio show every Monday night. But here I am in front of this legend. What do you think he wanted to talk about? Anybody know what his passion is or was? Soap operas. <laughs> Soap operas. He would come on Carson's show and he'd want to talk about soap operas. That was his thing. Well, you know, he's tried these guys, they travel so much. They spend so much time in the hotels. What are they going to do? Sit around and watch, uh, watch the shows. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. well, Alan, thank you so much. And now I can say a musician. Yes. Guys, thank you so much. Everybody on zoom. Uh, thanks. I, I really appreciate it.